guess since I was little, I was always pretty artistic and took art classes since I was four or five and um, always knew I would go to art school. But I was also pretty crafty as well. I was always really interested in making things and I learned to weave from a friend's mother when I was 15 years old. She gave me private weaving lessons. Uh, but even by the time I went to art school, I hadn't really considered that I could actually study textiles or crafts. I thought I would do painting. Um, but I took one course my second year at NASCAD, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, in the textiles department and that was it. I knew that that was what I had to do. And so during my four years at NASCAD, I focused on um, hand weaving. And so I ended up with a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a major in textiles. There's a lot of counting. <laughs> There's a lot of repetition of patterns and numbers um, and geometry as well. But once you have a good grasp on the, on the method and the process and what the rules are, I guess, the technical side of things, there's a huge amount of freedom within those parameters uh, for artistic expression, especially for what I have been doing in my art practice in weaving is really exploring hard data or scientific data um, and translating it through the language of weaving and textiles, really. And hand weaving in particular lends itself to that very well because everything is based on a grid. So whether you're looking at graphs or scientific data, essentially, you can kind of translate it through weaving and it becomes something else. It becomes something tangible and soft and comforting. And so there's a real um, interest in there for me, the juxtaposition between kind of the hard technical side of things and our associations with textiles when it comes to comfort or domesticity. I floundered for a couple of years. I didn't know <laughs> what I was going to be doing. I stayed in Halifax for a year after I graduated. And Halifax is not an easy city to stay in if you've just graduated from university because there's seven other universities there. And there's not a huge amount of jobs that pay above minimum wage. <laughs> and so I stuck around in Halifax for about a year working a couple of minimum wage jobs and trying to pay rent, basically. Um, I did, though, I had a great little job working as a production weaver for a woman who had her own little weaving business. And I did learn a lot from her about the kind of the business or production side of things in terms of efficiency and weaving. Um, so I, I decided to move back to PEI, I guess, a year after I graduated, just to figure stuff out and figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a couple of jobs in a row at the Confederation Center Art Gallery doing curatorial assistant stuff or collections management stuff. Um, and then I think it was in 2006, 2007 that I kind of decided that I was going to start my own business and start selling my work because um, I'd been selling little bits here and there over the years and I always sold everything I made in terms of the functional stuff. And so I kind of dove into that head first when my partner and I moved to Cornerbrook, Newfoundland in September 2007 so we could go to school. And so I got involved with the Craft Council in Newfoundland and they were a huge help in terms of the entrepreneurship side of things and launching my business and providing me with mentors as well who had worked in the craft industry. Um, and from there I was full on self-employed until about 2011. It took a year or two I think of just maturing and, and trying to learn what I didn't want to be doing along with what I did want to be doing. I think a large part of it is also process of elimination, right? <laughs> of just like, okay, I'm not satisfied working a nine to five job year round. It's not giving me what I need. I feel like I don't have enough time to do what I really want to do. And then also building the confidence as well to realize that I could make a go of it and I had the skills. And if I didn't have the skills, I could reach out to arts organizations, specifically the Craft Council. Um, to gain the, the resources and the knowledge that I needed to kind of move forward and develop what I was doing, especially when it came to the production weaving business side of things, right? Yeah, and not having a regular paycheck is challenging. Um, and the thing with uh, the craft industry in general, especially when you're talking about handmade craft where you're selling your work through craft fairs primarily, like jury craft fairs um, is mostly what I've done in the past, is also through, and also through shops in my online store, is that I was making about 80% of my income in October, November, and December, right, during the craft fair season, which is great. If you're selling a lot of the shows, it's awesome, you know? You, there's days where I've had like $1,400 days at a craft fair, and that's fantastic. But then you have a year or two years where, for whatever reason, people aren't buying as much and you're like uh, I made you know just more than half of what I was expecting to how am I gonna 
budget that money to last until next craft fair season, which is a year away. So the, the unpredictability of it was financially quite stressful sometimes, um, but it also forced you to be creative, right? Okay, well, have I saturated the market? Maybe I need to design some more different products and challenge myself a little bit more in the creative side of things as also, and also reach out for other avenues of selling my work. Um, another big part of, of being a craftsperson, I think, is having that community and that network of people around you who you are feeding off of creatively, but are also potentially providing more opportunities for you to sell your work and expose your work to new markets and new people who want to buy it. I just knew that that's, that was my path, was going to art school and being an artist of some kind. And my parents were always very supportive and encouraging, and um, their attitude was basically, just try your best, do your best, and we'll be your biggest cheerleaders. You know, like every time I came home from art school for a break, it would be like the two hour Rilla show and tell show, right? <laughs> of like showing what I'd been working on that semester. So their, number one, their support was always there. And number two, they were always really engaged and curious about what I was doing, which really helped in terms of my own confidence about what I was doing and also my ability to be able to talk about what I was doing as well. So yeah, I don't think I ever really got much resistance from anywhere, to be honest. Yeah, luckily. I definitely think it's possible, and I think it can be a really fulfilling and creative life. Um, I think you have to temper, temper it with making certain lifestyle choices, right? Unless you're lucky enough to find a partner who maybe does not work in the arts and has a very secure professional job. You have to choose a lifestyle that's not going to drain your bank account, right? So uh, it means maybe being a little bit more creative in terms of um, what type of house you live in or how much money you're paying for it, you know, the costs of, of daily life, right? Trying to bring those down in some kind of creative way so that you don't have that f as much financial stress because, because not having a regular paycheck every two weeks um, it's just a different way of, of budgeting your finances and, and making sure that you can you know, pay your bills as well, right? Uh, but I, I'm, yeah, I'm super encouraging. I think there's a lot of room for uh, creative entrepreneurship and artistic entrepreneurship, especially here on PEI. Part of it because we, we have a lifestyle on PEI that you, know, you don't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a house. I mean, there's tons of old places for sale that you can fix up if you want to. And, and then that basically becomes a tool to help you buy yourself time to build up your craft practice or your art practice, or whatever, you know, whatever area of artistic endeavor you pursue um, so that you don't have those added pressures that are basically taking you away from that. Because I think that's a big thing when it comes to having a, any type of art practice is consistently having the time to put into it. If you're, Working full-time takes up a lot of time, right? If you have a full-time job that's not related to your creative pursuits at all, it's really hard at the end of the day to carve away time for that. <laughs> so th the more ways you can find to buy yourself time to focus and concentrate on your practice and develop some ideas and maybe even develop some product lines if that's the route that you want to go down or develop, um, you know, apply for grants, work on bodies of work for exhibition. Uh, it's all a matter of buying yourself time. <laughs> so I work for Parks Canada four months of the year. Uh, this is my fifth season working with them. So my first couple of years with Parks, I was on contract. So it was just a foot in the door. And that was the strategy. I was very, very strategic about it, to be honest. Um, and uh, now I've been permanent seasonal for about two or three seasons. So that basically means that every year, Parks Canada has to give me, I think, between 17 and 19 weeks of work at a very good federal government wage. And so I work full time in the summers and it's very busy and I barely have enough time to just do dishes and play in the garden, let alone weave or pursue any of my um, art practice. But then I'm buying myself time. Then I have eight months the whole rest of the year to kind of plan how I want and work on the projects I want to work on. Um, so it's a nice balance. I, you know, like I, I like the cyclical nature of that. Also, too, I think being self-employed for so long before I worked for Parks, I was really used to it, kind of a seasonal cyclical nature. There was the fall, which was crazy busy, where I would be weaving all the time, getting ready for craft fairs, and then after Christmas it would slow down and I could work on art projects for a few months. And Parks Canada kind of slides really well into that 
cyclical way of working. I'm really busy in the summers, and then there's craft fair season after I finish my job with parks for the year, and then there's kind of a breather in the winter to focus on my art for a few months, and then gear back up to work in the summer. And also, too, working for Parks Canada, there's a real give and take there in terms of um, being in these beautiful environments on PEI, particularly our coastal environments, that then feed into my ideas for art projects, right? So there's, there's a nice, I don't know, symbiotic relationship, I guess you would call it, between the two, yeah. I do get a lot of comments at craft fairs that, you know, number one, people don't still do weaving, do they? You know, that's number one. Number two is, you must be a very patient person, right? And I'm like, well, it's kind of therapeutic to play with all these strings, but anyway. But then, yeah, people are willing to buy my work, right? And I mean, it's not cheap. I live in North America. I don't live in a country on the other side of the world where we pay slave wages. And I think there's a huge disconnect in North America these days between uh, the objects that we use every day, whether it's a mug, um, and how it was made. And I think that's part of what I'm selling as well. I'm selling the story of how this object was made that you're going to use in your daily life, right? The funny thing with art school, if you, if you choose to do a degree in craft or design, it's required to take a course called art and entrepreneurship. And it's also required to take another course called product design. But if you do a Bachelor of Fine Arts and you focus on, say, painting or sculpture or the more traditional artistic mediums, you don't have to take those courses. As if somebody who's a painter doesn't need to know about entrepreneurship and how to manage their business as well. I don't know, it's kind of a funny thing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the scale of my business is so tiny, right? It's, it's, it's just me. And I've often been asked before of like, you know, have you thought about hiring people to do the weaving for you? And well, then I become a business manager and I'm not interested in that. That's not why I started doing this. I started doing this because I have a love of working with my hands and making things. And if I go even a few weeks without weaving, I get a little itchy. Like I have to, I have to do it. So I can't imagine going to that extreme of the business side of things, where I, I basically am farming out the handwork to other people. I'm not interested in that. So that means the scale of my business is always going to stay small, which means the business side becomes pretty. It's man, it's very manageable. You know, I only have a certain amount of expenses and a certain amount of income <laughs> in terms of the different categories, and you just got to make sure everything balances out at the end of the day and hope that your income is quite a bit more than your expenses so that you're actually making money. I mean, like anything in life, it's practice, practice, practice. The more time you spend at something, the better you become at it, and the more confident you become about your skills. Um, isn't there, there's some kind of expression that you have to spend something like 10,000 hours doing something before you get really, really good at it. Um, so even if, even if you're still young, if you have an interest and you have a, a desire to spend copious amounts of time doing something, then do it. Right? Especially if it's a creative pursuit that you're going to be building your skills and building your skills and you're going to be improving. Um, yeah, I don't know. When I was younger, I just, like, I took art classes from age four basically until I f finished high school, right? It was my main extracurricular activity. And um, also finding avenues to show people your work and get feedback about your work and seek out people who have similar interests. I think in the arts especially, community is really important to um, not only gaining skills, but also feeling like you have a support network of similarly minded people, right? Um, I think growing up here on PEI in high school, the dominant culture was definitely sports culture. And if you were not into sports, it was just kind of like you were a bit of an outsider, right? So it's, part of it is finding your people. And I think when I went to art school, it was kind of like, oh, finally, oh, this is these are my people. And all of a sudden, I wasn't the weirdo anymore. There was people who were way more eccentric and artistic than I was. And that was a bit of a relief, you know, coming from high school and PEI, where it was not so much like that, right? So I don't know, spend a lot of time doing it. Um, practice, practice, practice. And continually seek out people who have similar interests as you. And I think the rest kind of happens organically. If you had told me when I was 15 or 16 years old if I could have envisioned a snapshot of what my life is like now as a 36-year-old, I would have been pretty impressed. I think it's pretty spot on with what my romantic ideal was as a teenager, for sure, in terms of you know, having the time to pursue art in some way. 
having um, the space to do that as well in a house that we've made our own. Um, yeah, I think I think my teenage self would be pretty pleased, <laughs> for sure. When we lived in Newfoundland, that was really a big stepping off point for me, getting involved with the Craft Council in Newfoundland, and I think that was as somebody in my, how old was I then, in my mid-twenties, late-twenties, that was a big realization because they were so helpful for me. And so since then, in other places I've lived, I've lived in Halifax since we lived in Newfoundland and then we moved back here, um, I think I've pursued involvement in the craft community in some way in every place I've lived, whether that's uh, in Halifax, I was involved with Halifax Crafters, which is a... Um, an organization that was started basically from NASCAD graduates who wanted to have kind of their own alternative craft fair um, and now it's going super strong and so I was on the organizing committee for that for a couple of years and that gave me an awesome community of again like-minded people who like to make stuff you know and who had a certain amount of skill and a certain amount of sophistication in their methods and their processes um, while also playing off the traditions. And then when I moved back here, I got involved with the PEI Craft Council, and I've been on the board of directors for about three years now. So again, making sure that you're involved and kind of have your ear to the ground a little bit with the arts organizations that are local to you. Um, also keeping, you know, buying art magazines, keeping an eye on like what's happening in the larger world as well when it comes to your particular field, I think is also really important. Um, being observant, you know. But yeah, the arts organizations that are around, I mean, that's what they're there for. They're there to provide kind of a center to a community that's focused on whether it's craft or the visual arts or dance or, you know, the writers. There's the Writers Guild of PEI. You know, there's all these organizations. So whatever your particular medium is, artistic medium, I don't know, seeking out your community is really important. Seek out examples of people who've been really successful at it and show the naysayers those examples. I mean, we have a lot of uh, very successful craftspeople on Prince Edward Island, for example. Um, the Dunes Gallery out in Brackley. Maybe some of the parents who are telling their kids not to go into the arts go out to lunch at the Dunes. Well, that place wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the vision of somebody who was very, very creative and started with his ceramics or pottery and then grew and grew and grew to include this whole concept that's now a restaurant, a gallery, an amazing architectural um, building, right, that's out there. So yeah, I don't know, coming up with examples of people who are pursuing a career that's similar to what you're interested in, in terms of creativity or crafts, working with your hands, and then, yeah, use them as examples to kind of counteract that negativity or the resistance that you might be getting in your life, because there's ways to do it, right? It's not. Um, you don't have to be a starving artist. That's a total myth. <laughs> you know? I mean, sadly, yes, our government does not give enough funding to the arts in terms of uh, the cultural sector in general, or they give a little bit and it goes and goes and goes, and then all of a sudden it's three steps backwards. It feels like it's, it's constantly back and forth. Um, but uh, I think if you look around you at examples of people, individuals or businesses who've made a success, not only for the economic side, but also what these... Um, artists are, are also contributing to our society and culture here in PEI. When, you know, our government loves to talk about tourism and putting money into tourism and how much money it brings in. Well, most of the tourists I talk to on PEI, they're interested. They're not interested in going to the McCain's French fry plant. They're interested in going to visit artists in their studios or going to see plays or going to hear live music, right? That's what people come here for. That's what gives a place its identity and gives a place its, its charm. And so we need, we need artists. We need young artists to stay on PEI and continue to contribute to the culture of the island and continue to change it and evolve it. It's not a static thing, right? Yeah, there's definitely been a resurgence in craft in the last 10 or 15 years in general. Like, uh, just the whole DIY, do-it-yourself movement in general is huge. I mean, even I'm noticing here on PEI, being part of the PEI Crafts Council, that we, like, 10 times a year, we're getting requests for various organizations or events that are happening that they want to have an artisan market component to their event, right? And that was not happening even a couple of years ago on PEI. There was the one PEI Craft Council show a year at the Confed Center, and that was it. 
So all of a sudden, there's a, in the last 10 years, I think personally, it's in reaction to technology. I think everything has become so, so digital and so with internet and smartphones and everything else. Everything's a little bit disconnected from our immediate tangible world. And I think in reaction to that interest in even things like people learn how to knit and they're really into knitting and uh, yeah, and these little pop-up craft fairs, do-it-yourself craft fairs. I think that's all part and parcel of the same thing. It's kind of in reaction to the digital world a little bit. And young people, um, I think, the, for example, at NASCAD in Halifax, the craft departments, like textiles, ceramics, jewelry, their enrollment is higher than it's ever been right now. So there's a real interest, uh, especially at not only in terms of making functional things that you sell at craft fairs, but also within the larger visual arts world of taking what are considered craft mediums and using them for art making practices. Um, and part of that is, I think, is just there's there's definitely a, a, you know multimedia. Uh, you know, being an artist is not so strictly defined anymore. Um, and the more creative your use of material and process, uh, more interesting the work becomes as well. Um, but yeah, the whole resurgence of do-it-yourself, uh, I think, is really strong right now. Um, for example, even you know, Etsy.com, an online marketplace to sell your work. I sell my work there. I've sold it there for years. Um, that would never have existed even 15 years ago, right? So it's, it's, it can be really empowering, I think, for people who maybe, you know, 20 years ago, well, unless you got a store to buy your work wholesale, you're not going to sell it. And now there's all sorts of opportunities for you to make stuff and sell it.